Thank you very much. I appreciate the uh, introduction and some of the many of the things said there. All the things said there, as a fact, matter of fact, except for one or two, and I'll talk about this later. <laughs> no, I, I really appreciate it all. I appreciate the time that I've had here with you over the last 24 hours. Um, I have put up here something different. There have been several requests made to me, so I, I went in and made a modification. Now, let's see uh, if I can figure out. Oh, okay, there it is. All right. Um, this is, this is my email address that will remain, so if you want to contact me about uh, uh, questions that come up after uh, the sessions this week or about any of the other things we're going to be doing at Hollifield Center, you should feel free to email me. That's, in fact, the easiest way to get a hold of me. I have published for the last five years uh, a print piece known as the Bullard Journal. Uh, starting with the January-February 2001 edition, it is no longer a print piece, but it has become an e-zine. And uh, we're still working because I knew when the first one came out that we would be changing it over to this Hollywood Leadership Center by the time of the third one, probably. Actually, the second one's going to be a transitional one. So the e-zine web address is www.newreformationsolutions.com slash Bullard Journal slash, and then this is the code you need, M3NF8K. And that'll take you to a, uh, uh, oh, an e-zine on the web that has about eight or ten pages with it uh, that, that is the latest stuff that I've been working on and different articles and things like that. And it is something you can connect and subscribe to. Uh, how right now we're going to handle the issue of... Uh, uh, of it going, uh, this is a sample edition that anybody can read and it'll be up there for a long time, but the last, the, the letters and numbers, the last six here, will change each edition, and so only subscribers will receive an email message telling them what the full address is, uh, so that they can find it on the web. And uh, so if you want to test this out, uh, there's the full address, you can go and see, in fact, what is there at this particular time. Uh, I'll also have that up during the uh, dialogue time later on, so if you didn't have time to get all those letters and numbers down, don't worry about it. Tonight, we're going to talk about relationship experiences and programmatic emphases in congregations who are reaching their full kingdom potential. Now, those of you who have been with us since the beginning last night know that we talked last night about visionary leadership and accountable management and how those two relate to one another. You'll also know that at 10.30 this morning, uh, we talked about the whole life cycle and how vision, relationships, programs, and management fit together in a Lexus sports utility vehicle as a metaphor for the church and uh, how it plays out throughout the life of a congregation in terms of dominance and subdominance and strength and weakness and uh, active and passive and, and awake and asleep kind of thing. Uh, the piece of the puzzle that I want to give you tonight, however, is this uh, piece related or directly focused on relationship experiences and, and programmatic emphases. And to contrast these two tonight, like last night I contrasted visionary leadership and accountable management. The way this works is, uh, first of all, I want us to go through and explain each of the pieces. And then I want to give you not only some, some lists, of short list of things that uh, contrast the two, but I want to tell you some stories because that, that really is the key piece in, in understanding how these particular issues work, and then at the end we'll, uh, we'll have time for a Q&A. Relationship experiences I would define as the spiritual, relational, and congregational processes by which persons engage in a Christ-centric faith journey. Relationship experiences as one of the organizing principles or elements of the life of a congregation uh, relate to what I would really call the rudder of the congregation or as in my sports utility vehicle, the, the factor of navigation. You know, it is vision that is giving us the power and the move forward. But it is relationship experiences that are providing for us the, the, the sense of the direction of the journey, where we're going on the map in terms of the journey. And so relationship experiences quite simply refer to our relationship to God through Jesus Christ and our relationship to one another in a community of faith and to the context in which God has placed us. So it deals with the vertical and the horizontal relationship. 
Uh, other ways to put it, some of them significant, some of them trite, but all of them in an attempt to try to uh, uh, have focus this illustration on you. It is how we turn irreligious people into fully devoted followers of Christ. It is, in fact, the disciple-making process in the life of the congregation. It is how we help people to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It relates to categories, if you were looking at it from a linear perspective, such as how we do evangelism, how we do new member recruitment, how we do assimilation of people, how we uh, do spiritual growth and, and, and fellowship and care, uh, how we do leadership development, and how we engage people in gift-oriented mission and ministry action. So it is that whole continuum process of what's going on in the life of the congregation. Uh, it, it has to do with whether or not we are the kind of congregation that makes disciples who make disciples. So how is the software of the life of the congregation going? How is it doing? What is happening? Is the, the, the basic essence and character and nature of the church happening in people's lives individually and corporately. Now, there are phases of the relationship experiences, as I went through just a minute ago, but I want to go back through and state them because very often I will go into a congregation and I'll sit down, say, with its staff leadership or with its key lay leadership, and I'll just get them to talk to me about what's happening in these five phases of the relationship experiences process and uh, get them to, just, to talk to me about it, and then also to get them to talk to me about the thread that holds it together. And you'll see that in just a minute. So I'll ask them, first of all, tell me what you intentionally do in this congregation to share the gospel message with pre-Christians, and what you intentionally do to do new member recruitment among unchurched folks. And uh, sometimes I get good and involved discussion. Sometimes I get blank stares and dumb looks, you know, and, uh, but, and, and that's unfortunate when, when, when that comes. But to ask them, tell me uniquely, specifically, who is asking to be held accountable for the, the exercise of the gift of evangelism and, and, and the gift of inviting people into the life of the congregation? So how is evangelism and new, recruit, new member recruitment going? And then one of the other pieces I ask them is, after you evangelize, if you do, people and recruit them in regard to, to connecting with your congregation, how do you make the carryover to the process of entry and the initial assimilation of these people into the church? And that's when I really get blank stares. Because people hadn't thought that there ought to be a connector along the process of disciple making. That each one of those things sort of exists uh, as an entity in and of themselves, and if there happens to be carryover to the next phase of becoming more deeply involved in the life of the congregation, it's accidental, and it's not intentional. You know, it, it's, it's like when you begin to talk about this issue of, of church growth, or uh, it's more popular these days to talk about church health, but let's, let's stay with the focus of church growth. I often say to folks, church growth it has been overcomplicated over the last 30, 35 years. It is really a very simple process. You grow a church by inviting and encouraging successfully more people who are not on an, an intentional Christ-centric faith journey in the midst of a caring faith community, a congregation, to be involved with us. That's way one. Way two is you get more people who are connected with the Christ-centric faith journey in the context of a congregation to go grow deeper in the relationship to God and Jesus Christ through Jesus Christ. And finally, you get less people who have been on a Christ-centric faith journey in the congregation to get bored and apathetic and drop out. Really, everything else about church growth is cream. You know, it's just basically those three things happening uh, over and over again in the life of folks. And, uh, you know, as, as we often say, uh, it used to be in, in, in places where I went that 20 years ago when you talked about people who were your most faithful people in church, you meant people who were in worship 46 out of 52 weeks. Now the barometer of faithfulness is somewhere between 38 and 39 weeks. Those are full-time, fully active people. You know, one of the 
people talk about increasing attendance. One of the easiest ways to increase attendance is to get everybody to come two more Sundays a year. Your attendance will go up. You didn't reach anybody. And, and that's not good growth. I mean, but that is that's the kind of growth sometimes is, is all that we're getting in some places. But the issue is, what are you intentionally doing to evangelize, to bring new people into the along the faith journey of your congregation? And then how how do people actually enter you? I mean, other than the official connecting as a member, and by the way, and I think this is familiar to, to many of you all, uh, increasingly the actual membership in a congregation is becoming less and less valuable to people. They talk more about the issue of being connected with the congregation and being involved in it, and somewhere along the line at, at, at some particular place, they may actually formally join. You know, it used to be when I was growing up, perhaps it still here is in the Maritimes, that, uh, you know, actually officially joining the congregation was your permission to be involved in certain activities. You know, I can remember when my father as a pastor would, would uh, uh, said to a, uh, a woman in the church who uh, he saw singing in the choir one day, he said, I'm not sure you ought to sing anymore in the choir until you decide to join the church. Now... Sometimes a third to half of the choir aren't members of the church. They're in the process of becoming. They are connected, but they don't have formal membership as of yet. And so that where along the continuum of involvement in a congregation, formal membership occurs is a, is a radically different thing. When I grew up, you joined the closest Baptist church within a month after moving to a new area. Now it's sometime between year one and two. Uh, when my wife and I have taken our turn as as deacon families and praying in the pastor's office during the morning worship service at our church, uh, one of the things that's very interesting is the long list that now goes into two pages of people who were with some regularity attending our church but have not yet formally joined. One of them is a fellow that's in my Sunday school class named Dick Dickens who's been attending for eight years, and the only reason they didn't elect him chairman of the ushers last year was that he wasn't a member yet. But he, he's one of the most regular and faithful ushers we have during worship on Sundays. The third part of all of this is, how are you involving people in the fellowship, care ministry, and full assimilation in the life of the congregation? You know, it is uh, it, one of the things that you hear a lot of people in congregations say is that we're a warm, friendly fellowship. We're very welcoming to people. If you want to know whether or not people feel fully included in the life of the congregation, don't ask the people who have been around for 10 years or more, ask the people who have been around for two years or less. Are you, have you been fully included in the life and ministry and care focus of this congregation? You know, when, when you see the sick list and, 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 and everybody in the congregation seems to know who's sick, but you were sick and had surgery and nobody seems to know, that's a pretty good indication you haven't been in, included in the loop yet. You know, you're not one of the, the care kinds of folks. Um, how are you doing at spiritual growth and leadership development? You know, how are you helping people literally to grow in their faith experience and to understand their gifts, their skills, and their will, their preferences, shall we say, and, and, and to be focused on where they can provide leadership? How empowering are you of laity? Do you have a lay mobilization movement within the life of your congregation? And then finally... Are, are we focusing on the kingdom involvement and a missional lifestyle for people? Are we permission giving for people to find their call in ministry at various strata and to be able to, to, to lead out in it and to be a, an active part of what's going on in mission and ministry around it? So that's the basic concept of relationship experience. It is the soft side of which programmatic emphases are the hard side. Relationship experiences and programmatic emphases, in fact, are two sides of the same coin. Programmatic emphases are our functional attempts to provide uh, projects, ministries, services, activities, and training, such as worship, music, education, and training, and weekday and community activities, and we could go on and on and on. They are the visible things that we see in the life of the congregation. You know, the relationship experiences relate to the kinds of things we think ought to happen in people's lives. Uh, programmatic emphases have to do with the calendar things and ways these happened. Uh, you know, and, and the visible things that indeed we can see. For instance, a programmatic emphasis um, 
Well, well, I'll wait just a minute. A programmatic emphasis involves uh, this determining we're going to do something, then beginning to provide the capacity for it, like putting it on the calendar, uh, staffing for it, maybe even building facilities for it, uh, providing equipment for it, uh, planning to do it, preparing for it, carrying it out, evaluating it, and then doing it all over again. That's all a part of how we go about the process of dealing with programmatic emphases. Some of the programmatic emphases categories are, are some of the functional or programmatic things we do in the church. Uh, and programmatic emphases, we're always setting calendars. As you know, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard that, but we talk about this a lot in the states, that the, the, the humorist from Oklahoma, Will Rogers, always said he was tired of his taxes to pay, uh, being, uh, being taken from him to pay for roads to be built for Baptists to tear down going to meetings. You know, we as Baptists know how to put a lot of things on the calendar. You know, we tend to be busy, like the, the, the retired woman who said, you know, now that I've reached a certain age and, and certain lowering of my overall energy, I don't think I'm healthy enough to be a Baptist anymore. And uh, because, you know, we just are so busy in the kinds of things we do. It has to do with family and age group programming. It has to do with the structures, the infrastructure uh, of disciple making. Now, I have a key question for you about turning programmatic emphases into relationship experiences. And you see already in that statement a value that I want to place out there. And I want to start by suggesting this to you. <coughs> Are Sunday morning worship experiences in your congregation programmatic emphases or relationship experiences? To which the answer is probably yes, and it depends. What I would like to suggest to you, that Sunday morning worship, worship services in your congregation are at least programmatic emphases in this manner. We determine to do them, then we literally build significant capacities for them. We probably, over the years, spent the most amount of money on building and keeping in shape a place in which we have worship. We tend to spend our most staff money hiring someone to lead it, or someone's to lead it. Uh, we definitely have it on the calendar, and it's sort of a sacred time in the sense that, that nothing else can happen then. Uh, we make plans about it ahead of time. The music leaders prepare for it. Sometimes the pastor even prepares for it. We carry it out. We evaluate it, and then we do it over again. So, from that perspective, um, Sunday morning worship services are a programmatic emphasis. Fits all the definition. But what I would like to ask you is, is the purpose of Sunday morning worship in your church so that people may leave worship and say, well, been there, done that, got a t-shirt and a new notch in my Bible, see you next week maybe. Or is the purpose of Sunday morning worship in your congregation that people would be able to leave there not necessarily literally saying these things, but feeling some things like, wow, <coughs> I experienced God in a special way today. I, I, I've never heard that biblical story come alive like it came alive tonight, today. Boy, I, I needed that message. That, that, was, that was a message time for me. He was preaching right at me. You know, that, that, the, the music, you know, it, it just, I, I was in the mood to hear that music. It was wonderful. I encountered God today in worship in a special and unique way. Well, I think it's hands down that these latter things that I've said are what we would hope would be the, the results or the evaluation that people would to give when they leave worship. Because the purpose of worship is not to have carried it out, to have done it, to have held it. The purpose of worship is indeed to have worshiped God and the purpose of worship in a worship service, corporate worship service in church, is to have worshiped God together in the midst of a faith community. And therefore, that our lives might at, at minimum be refreshed for the week that is ahead. And that we would have really have taken the Sabbath to be still and know that I am God. So, well, George, what are you saying over, over a long period of time? Well, what I'm saying is, if on more Sundays than not, 
more people than not, can lead Sunday morning worship in your congregation with relationship experience evaluation as opposed to programmatic emphasis evaluations. Remember those were, been there, done that, got a t-shirt and a new notch in my Bible. Then worship in your congregation is probably a relationship experience. If they can't leave there with relationship experience evaluations, then it's probably a programmatic <coughs> event. If it's a programmatic event, you're not making disciples who are making disciples. You are not helping people grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You are not turning your religious people into fully devoted followers of Christ. You are not understanding the linear continuum that I've suggested to you of the stages of congregational connection. Let's try another, because it's very important. In fact, though I would say that the most important thing that can happen in the life of a congregation is that uh, you would have a, a magnetic, positive, powerful vision that God had bestowed upon you that embraced or enveloped or captivated the whole congregation and fueled you forward. I would tend to say that's the most important thing. The second thing I would say is, but if you don't have clear relationship experiences happening, you're not doing the work of the church. Now, you cannot do clear relationship experiences without some sort or semblance of programmatic emphasis acting as the infrastructure undergirding it. But the success of the program is not the thing. The successful maturing of disciples on a spiritual journey is the thing. And so that's what we're trying to, in the midst of all of this, uh, get, a, get an excellent focus on. Now let's take another premise. How about a, an adult Sunday school class in your church? What is it? Programmatic emphasis? Relationship experience? Hmm. I had the wonderful opportunity for about eight years to be a member of a Sunday school class in my own church that on many a Sunday approached being a relationship experience. It was started out, uh, the class started about 11 years ago, and it started out as a class for couples. You can tell the, the old 1950s style of age group grading was there. It was for couples where at least one of the spouses was born in the year 1948 through 1952. And so that class we were called Co-Ed Adult Four. You know, we had this, this great artistic title, you know, Co-Ed Adult Four. And so my wife and I began in that class about 11 years ago. And, uh, over the period of, of the eight years of the class, as our congregation almost doubled in size, uh, more of the female spouses than the male spouses gravitated out of the class into some kind of Sunday school leadership position to respond to the growth that was occurring. And my wife was one of those. You know, and it finally got to a point from a, a male chauvinist uh, understanding that it was a really good class. There were two men to every woman. <laughs> And so in those early 15 minutes of the class, we could talk about, we could dominate the conversation. So hunting, fishing, sports, chewing, spitting, you know, all that kind of stuff. But uh, that was able to be the dominating, dominating conversation in that uh, 15 minutes of gathering time. Then we would have Sunday school class announcements and, and, and prayer requests and prayer. And then our teacher, a wonderful person who was an accountant, uh, stood up to teach the class. Now, Glenn, the accountant who taught the class, fit exactly into that thought pattern that God doesn't ask for your ability. He asks for your availability. Because Glenn couldn't hardly teach his way out of a wet paper sack. But being an accountant, he would show up on time dressed to play. He had read quarterly and he had read all the supplemental stuff and, 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 and he would try to go at it best. He, uh, he, he once told me, we had in Southern Baptist life uh, uh, a retired pastor who had for years, and he had continued in the retirement, written a parallel commentary to the primary adult Sunday school literature. His name was Herschel H. Hobbs. And so he wrote the Hobbs commentary. 
And, and Glenn one day said to me, he said, you know, George, you know, if, if, if Hobbs ever dies, I'm dead. <laughs> well, the Sunday after Hobbs died, <laughs> I happened to be present in Sunday school that day. That was one of those one out of four Sundays that I make it to, to Sunday school in my own church with, with my work. And uh, so we had had our 15 minutes of frivolity, and we were going around the room with prayer requests, got around to me, and I, I faked crying. You know, I said, yeah, I, I think we ought to pray for the family of Herschel H. Hobbs who died this week. You know, and Glenn, he looked up at me, it was the deer in the headlights look, you know. <laughs> Don't worry, Glenn, don't worry. They've had this other guy riding with him for the last three or four years because they knew he couldn't live forever. Oh, oh. The big one at them. But, uh, so he was relieved, you know? And, uh, so, uh, several years ago, uh, about the next to the last year that this class existed before we reorganized Sunday School, uh, we had this couple to join our class uh, who had moved from, um, from California. And uh, they moved from a Christian and Missionary Alliance background, and on our side of town there was no CMA church. And so they visited around and finally connected with our church and joined our Sunday school class. Uh, he was, uh, they were out of Silicon Valley, and he was uh, a computer nerd work, working for an East Coast company then. And uh, uh, she didn't work, Pat didn't work. Pat was a very interesting uh, and unusual individual. That, Gave us great delight and joy. I mean, because she was always livening up the class. You know, it was great. And so, uh, uh, Pat, Pat was a, a um, was a distinctive dresser. I think that's the best way I would say it. Uh, Pat had her red Sunday, and on her red Sunday, she'd wear a red dress and red hose and red shoes and red makeup and red jewelry and a red hat and elbow length leather red gloves. You know, and she had her blue Sunday. She had a similar outfit uh, that she wore on those days. Now. Um, Pat and her husband moved into an apartment with their two daughters when they moved to our town, and they were building a house. And over the next six or eight months, a lot of people in our Sunday school class helped them with a lot of things in their transition. So when they got into their new house that they built, they were very grateful. And uh, they were in one of those situations where they'd come from high-priced California to Columbia, South Carolina, and so they could build a whole lot more house than they had had in California. And they wanted to invite everybody over to their house for a dinner that they were going to prepare on, on Valentine's weekend. You know, it's right about Valentine's Day in the States now. Do y'all do Valentine's Day here? Yeah. Yeah, okay, tomorrow, guys. Remember, it's tomorrow. Um, and so I've already given my wife her Valentine before I left town but, uh, and taken her out to eat. In fact, it's, she's getting the best of both ends. I've taken her out to eat last Friday night for Valentine's, and then another couple's invited us out, and she says, boy, will you take me out again this Friday night for Valentine's? So when I get home Friday, i got to take her out again. I mean, I have the privilege, the wonderful privilege. <laughs> and so uh, uh, Pat and Bill invited the whole Sunday school class to come to their house for a Valentine's weekend dinner that they were going to prepare and serve to everyone to say thank you for helping us out in the, over these last six to eight months. Thank you for taking us in and making us a part of who you are. Well. You know, we, we, we try to say, oh, no, Pat, let us all bring Oh, no, 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 I, I want to do it. Well, e each week, Pat would give an update in Sunday school class about different elements of what she was doing to prepare for this weekend. And I remember one week her announcement was when I was there, she was this toga she was sewing for Bill to wear while he served us the meal. You know, and uh, it was just going to be sort of this love feast kind of thing. Well, it happened that in our Sunday school curriculum about that time, there was a... Uh, there were a series of lessons about, that went on for about six weeks about issues of, of, of human sexuality. And uh, that, that was a tough group of lessons to teach. My wife at that time was teaching an adult women's class uh, where the, um, the organizing principle of the class was women without a husband present in Sunday school. And uh, there were women with all kinds of uh, interesting backgrounds there. And so uh, issues of human sexuality were hot issues in that class of women. And my wife had a uh, tough time teaching those lessons. But she finally chickened out about halfway through and started teaching the book of Esther, but that was all right. And uh, <laughs> I showed up one Sunday, and, and uh, Glenn, I said, Oh, George, I'm so glad you're here today. I'm really going to need help with this lesson. Well, you see, the lesson that day was on sexual abuse. I said, Glenn, you're on your own, man. I don't touch this subject with a 40-foot pole. You know, I'm no help today. George, George, you got to help. No, no help, no help. You know, I've, I've given him a hard time. 
Well, we had our 15 minutes of frivolity, we had our prayer request, we had our prayer time, and Glenn stood up getting ready to teach. And then Pat said, ooh, 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 Glenn, Glenn, can I say something? And, you know, we realized all of a sudden we hadn't had the weekly announcement from Pat. And the dinner was coming up in 10 days. And so uh, Pat, uh, Glenn said, sure, Pat. He said, well, well can, can I come up there and say it? Yeah, sure, sure, come on up, Pat. And so uh, uh, Pat came up to the front of the class, and she turned around the class, and she was being dramatic, you know, and she put her hands together, sort of like this, like a young lady getting ready to recite. And you know, we were all falling out of our chair by the end, you know, just didn't know what was coming. And so uh, th then Pat got real serious, and she said, you know, uh, I, I read this Sunday school lesson last Sunday afternoon, and, and I knew what was coming up. And I've been talking and praying with Bill all week about this, and, and I finally decided that for the first time in my adult life, this is a place where I want to share this. And then she took the next four or five minutes and proceeded to talk to us about her personal sexual abuse at the hands of her father as a young lady growing up in California. And then she sat down. And then there wasn't a dry eye in the place. You should have seen Glenn the camera. Just bawling trying to now teach that class. Because she said, I've never been a part of a community of people who cared for the Lord and cared for one another like this class does. Well, on many a Sunday, that adult Sunday school class characterized a relationship experience a whole lot more than it characterized a programmatic emphasis. And it didn't take a biblical scholar as teacher <coughs> to produce that. It took someone who was faithful to live out the word and then try to act as a discussion leader with fellow pilgrims who were trying to get into God's word and relate to one another and relate to the Lord. The way I really say it is, it's sort of like the Jewish theologian Martin Buber's book, I Vow. And I don't want to make trite uh, some of the references that you could use coming out of that book. But, it, but it's sort of like, you know, as we understand that um, when, when Moses experienced God in the form of the burning bush, that the actual experience of that was a very genuine and authentic I-thou experience. But when Moses went away from that encounter, that worship experience, and tried to talk to others about it, it wasn't, an, the telling others about it was not an I thou, it was an I it. Something less than the real thing. Relationship experiences and congregations are the real thing. Programmatic emphases aren't. They're the structure we put in place that seems to allow the real thing to happen. We measure programmatic emphases by the success of the program. How many people are enrolled? How many people are in attendance? We measure the success of relationship experiences not by enrollment and attendance, say like in Sunday school, but by of the people who are regular, regularly involved in a Sunday school class or a small group Bible study or other small group experience. What percentage of those people give evidence of the fact that they're growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? That's relationship experience. That's the kind of thing that congregations who are reaching their full kingdom potential are made of. See, programmatic emphases are task-oriented. They provide stability. They're how we get things done. And while they do relate to the missional direction, uh, it is almost like mission over anything else. Relationship experiences are people-oriented. They provide flexibility. They are more like things felt. And they are morale builders in the life of congregations and in the lives of people. To repeat what I said last night, now that you've got all four factors out there, <clears throat> congregations where the primary focus of what they're involved in are visionary leadership 
and relationship experience are growing younger and more vital on a regular basis. Congregations who place their primary focus and weight on programmatic emphases and accountable management are growing older and more passive daily. And they cannot touch the hem of the garment of kingdom potential, though they may go on for decades as efficient congregations. Whoops. You lean on it and that's what you get. This us go back. What I wish for you and your congregation is an understanding of how visionary leadership and relationship experience supported by programmatic emphases and accountable management can help you soar with a strength that you know not of as you seek to soar in reaching your full kingdom potential. Thank you.